everybody and uh, welcome to this uh, trade union freedom for Urgelan uh, campaign event um, on the 15th of February. Before I just say a few opening remarks, can I just um, remind everybody please to keep uh, their microphones um, muted and we are recording the session tonight so that we can post it online and everyone um, will have the opportunity to watch it if they can't um, see it tonight. So look, first of all, thanks to everybody for making the effort to attend this event to mark the anniversary of the abduction of Kurdish leader Abdullah Erjelan. This event is not only to mark the fact that we are now unbelievably about to enter the 24th year of Abdullah Erjelan's incarceration, but also to call for an end to his inhumane treatment and isolation in prison, and also indeed for his immediate release so that he can play the part that only he can play in terms of bringing about peace in Turkey and the wider region. Colleagues, I'm not going to spend too long now as we've got some great speakers with us tonight that are going to make some contributions, but I do want to just say a few opening um, remarks. Abdullah Erjelan is without doubt a leader of the Kurdish people and political movement. We in the trade union movement have absolutely no doubt whatsoever that Mr Erjelan and the movement he leads and inspires share our values, those of peace, democracy, equality, inclusiveness, women's rights and social justice. Anyone who doubts that needs only to look at the reality of where his ideas have been put into practice. If you look at um, the eastern part of Turkey in the Kurdish areas before Erdogan attacked the Kurdish region, we saw the co-chair system in operation and the attempts to really build a much more inclusive, peaceful and democratic society. Uh, many of you will be aware of the amazing experiment that's going on in northeastern Syria, um, emerging from the ruins of the civil war and trying to build a new society based on exactly those values of democracy, equality and inclusiveness. The total isolation of Abdullah Erjelan from his friends, family and lawyers is not only an absolute human rights abuse, one that has been condemned by the Committee for the Prevention of Torture, but it's also a gross and perverse act of hypocrisy by Turkey and President Erdogan. Because between 2013, 2013 and 2015, the Turkish state was engaged in deep negotiations with Mr. Erjelan to try and find and bring about a negotiated and peaceful solution to the conflict. That was until Turkey uh, decided to revert to the path of war because Erdogan lost his majority in the election in 2015 and events in Syria proved to be too frightening and he preferred to effectively back the forces of ISIS rather than engage on the path of peace and uh, social justice. Colleagues, this trade union campaign calling for the freedom of Abdullah Erjelan was set up in 2016, following the horrific events that the world witnessed in Kobani and the Syrian area and the war that was declared on the Kurdish population in the cities in Turkey itself. We set the campaign up in April 2016, and it was my own union, Unite, and the GMB union that initiated the campaign. Since 2016, we've grown very rapidly and now have as many as 17 trade unions in membership in the UK. We were the main theme at the massive Durham Miners uh, Gala in 2018, 
and the international theme at the Tolpuddle Martyrs uh, Festival in 2019, two of the most important events in the British trade union calendar. In 2019, the TUC Congress, all 700 delegates, held up a picture of Abdullah Erjilan and then demonstrated in quite remarkable act of solidarity their call for his immediate release. Since then, we have done exactly the same event when all 700 delegates at the Unite Conference held up the picture to demonstrate their solidarity. And we know that NEU Teachers Union are planning to do the very same at their conference this year as well. We've pushed the international, uh, the, uh, the issue very hard in the wider international arena. We've proudly supported the work of um, parliamentarians and the all party parliamentary group. We have had delegations going to um, Rojava itself in northeastern Syria to witness firsthand the situation on the ground there. And we send regularly observers to trials in Turkey as well. So the campaign has grown rapidly, but we're very well aware we have so much work to do to bring about the pressure that is needed to bring the release of Abdullah Erjilan. Colleagues, I'm going to move into our first session. And without further ado, I'm going to turn to our speakers. We have Ogmunda Johnson, we have Doug Nichols, Vicky Blake, and Lloyd Russell Moyle, MP. I'll introduce them and say a few more words as I ask them to speak. I'm going to begin with Ogmunda Jonensen, who is a member of the International Initiative Campaigning for the Freedom of Abdullah Erjilan. Ogmunda is a good friend. He is a former minister in many different posts in the Icelandic government. He's a member of the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe and has been a participant in the Imrali delegations in person to Turkey that have tried to get access to um, Mr. Abdullah Erjilan. Colleagues, if I can ask you as well, please try to stick to your five minute times because we have got um, a lot to get through tonight. Ogmunda, it's my pleasure to give you the floor. Thank you very much, Simon. I will stick to the five minutes. But yesterday we completed a two day virtual visit to Turkey. Uh, this Imrali delegation, as we call our mission, is the largest ever with 18 members from countries worldwide. As before, the delegation was organized by the international initiative Freedom for Abdullah Özalan, Peace in Kurdistan, and this time in cooperation with British trade unions and uh, people with connections uh, in international uh, human rights organizations, lawyers and writers organizations, and women's organizations in particular. Now, why the largest uh, Imrali delegation ever? I think this reflects growing concern worldwide over developments in Turkey and a deep dissatisfaction with silence of the international community, including the Council of Europe, including the United Nations. Because silence means complicity in crimes and human rights violations committed before the very eyes of the world. And what do we want the world to see after our visit? We want the world to realize that systemic oppression is on the increase in Turkey and it all starts in Imrali. The isolation of Abdullah Asalan is a method of introducing fascism. We were told that uh, isolation prisons were being built in Turkey and that in present prisons isolation was being introduced as a method 
it was becoming common practice. And it does not stop at this, because publishers, trade unionists, lawyers, writers, journalists, human rights activities, activists are being persecuted and imprisoned for raising the banner of human rights, for calling attention to the fact that women are being molested and raped in prison, that uh, sick people suffering from cancer, from dementia, are being denied uh, medical care in the prisons. For these people are being shut up for years in prisons for standing up against fascism, for calling attention to human rights abuse. And the idea of isolation is to tell these people when they are imprisoned and punished that they are alone, that they are isolated. And this, the entire Kurdish nation is also meant to take as a fact of life. They are isolated, they are alone. And it is here that we step in. This is why we are going to Turkey year after year on the Imrali delegation. And we are urging the world to wake up, to stand up, to break the isolation of the Kurds, not only in the prison, but in society at large. And uniting with the Kurds in their struggle for freedom, for human rights. Now, we are also saying that it is in Ram, Imrali that we should start our fight because Imrali is a prototype of fascism. And this prototype must be eliminated. We must unite in the demand that the cell of Abdullah Öcalan be opened. We call upon the United Nations, we call upon the Council of Europe, we call upon trade unions throughout the world, we call upon all human rights organizations, all individuals to unite. Freedom for Abdullah Öcalan, peace in Kurdistan. It is time to unite. Thanks so much, um, Ogmunda, and thanks so much for all the efforts you've made over many years in trying to promote the um, campaign and, as you say, say, open the cell door and allow access again to Abdullah Erjalan. I'm going to pass the floor straight across to Doug Nichols. Doug Nichols is the General Secretary of the General Federation of Trade Unions in the UK. He was formerly a member of my own union, an official in the union, and has also always been a tireless campaigner for human rights causes, causes and has um, indeed with the GFTU organized many events trying to push the cause for freedom for Abdullah Erjalan. Doug, pleasure to give you the floor. Thanks, Simon. <coughs> The um, delegation was very moving and very powerful and many new and strong things were said by the colleagues that we met from the most representative bodies in law, human rights, women's movement, civic organisation and prisoners, families and so on. But as human beings, I was reflecting that many of them had been in prison themselves, many were facing trial, many had lost loved ones, and many of them, including one of Ojalan's relatives, of course, haven't seen their relatives for some time. And that made me reflect on the first time I was aware of the Kurdish struggle, which was when there was a newspaper article over here in about 1982 of how the women were being treated in the Turkish jails, the women from the Kurdish movement. And we met a number of people who were talking about what was happening in the prisons. 
Now in Turkey, you've got 368 prisons. You've got about 43,000 prisoners, which is comparative to populations and so on, four times the average national prison population that there is in the rest of Europe. And the conditions which moved me so much 40 years ago have got worse. Indeed, every speaker that we met over the last two days said that things in Turkey for progressive people and the Kurds had got worse and worse over the last year. Now, someone said that the only people who get out of prison there now are dead bodies. And another feature of the high prison population in Turkey is that many, many are suffering these lifelong sentences and many, much more so than many other countries, are in there for 30 years. And one of the latest little tricks they've got, apart from making sure that political prisoners' food is contaminated with insects and so on, is to trip up prisoners who are coming to the end of a 30 year sentence with some false allegations and some penalties about their manners and their behavior to give them another three months in prison after the 30 years. And this is reflected time and time again in the kind of oppression that people are facing. As a former representative of youth workers, I was struck by the fact that the police in Turkey are now selling drugs openly outside schools. And we're waiting for a dossier to tell us about the number of young people who've been mown down by uh, armoured vehicles and so on and killed by the state and how many of the 500 young people there are actually in prison in a new attempt to alienate and destroy the next generation of people who want peace and progress in the region. So the situation has become more brutal. And although the colleagues in, in Kurdistan have been consistently and repeatedly making their appeals and making their representations to the international organizations that should be doing something about torture and cruelty and human rights and of course to their own uh, bodies set up for that purpose they are rapidly losing confidence in those organizations their confidence is rocked because progress has not taken place and that i think gives us a new edge in the trade union movement in britain one of the comrades there said, we've got to raise the bar of our struggle. And when we heard that before, was when it got difficult in the Mandela situation. And I reflect on the fact that even Mandela's lawyers have said that the kind of isolation and the torture that uh, Erdogan is facing wasn't directly faced by uh, Mandela. It's quite an exceptional and a unique form of imprisonment for Erdogan, which is now cascading and being reflected throughout the prison population of political prisoners, men and women and young people. The seven years war that Turkey has been waging is now, of course, leading to a huge economic crisis. The official inflation rate is 48 percent. Our colleagues over there thought it was actually more like 114 percent and this is leading to poverty and desperation in a, in a new scale so i think this is an absolutely critically timed meeting and delegation which means that we've all got to up the game and we've got to find some practical and uh, united solutions to really push this one forward has said that he was the Mandela of the Middle East, how true that is and how much we've got to do to uh, assist the situation. Thanks. Th thanks very much, Doug. And I think it's absolutely right and correct that we do compare the situation of Abdullah Erjalan with that of Nelson Mandela, both on a prison island in isolation for so long, but it's also right that you remind us, even Mandela's lawyers are saying that he faces worse conditions in his incarceration than even Mandela did himself. We shouldn't also forget that next year is a presidential election in Turkey and that there's a lot of jostling going on and that will be a very critical election 
indeed for the future of Turkey and the wider region. Colleagues, without further ado, I want to um, invite Vicky Blake to um, say a few words as well. Vicky was elected as vice president of the uh, University and College um, Workers Union in uh, 2019 and is now the president. And I have to say, Vicky has got industrial action with her members running today, has been all over the show. And Vicky, we are honoured that you've managed to find the time in your busy day with all the difficulties you've got going on to join us and say a few words. It's a mark of how serious you see you take the campaign. The floor's yours, Vicky. Thank you very much, Simon. And thank you very much for inviting us to be part of the event. Um, as you just noted, we are taking industrial action across higher education at the moment in UCU. Um, and that's about 50,000 of us out uh, on strike over the next few weeks. But um, what I think is really important is the way that we use our picket lines as site of education. And we also run teach out, so teaching online and off campus in a more democratic way than perhaps happens in your standard classroom when we're not on strike. And the kinds of conversations that we can have in those spaces extend to the kind of international work that we need to be doing more of as a union. So I see the fact that we are taking action as workers in the UK to be part of this linked struggle for a better world. Um, so I thought I would start by saying a little bit about how we came to be part of this campaign and why it matters that we do more and also about the space I think we need to open up to work out how we can be effective as a trade union movement in supporting the Freedom for Ocalan campaign and in supporting the Kurdish people. Um, so UCU is a post-16 education union in the UK, which represents, we represent about 130,000 members across further and higher education, prison education and community education. So we're, we're quite a big union. We have got very strong international policy commitments as a union. And um, as part of my role as president, I chair an international working group. Um, there's an awful lot going on and there's an awful lot that we feel we should be doing more of. But we decided that we needed to join the, this campaign, the Freedom for Uchulan campaign, because while we were already doing quite a lot of work around human rights violations in Turkey, and we've been working with our sibling unions in Turkey regarding academic freedom and, and all of the terrible things that have been happening recently at Boazici and, and other universities, we realised that in the context of everything that was happening, we really needed to broaden out the support that we demonstrably give to the Kurdish people and to really highlight and address the treatment that they are receiving from the Turkish government, from the current Turkish government. And honestly, when I think about, when I first learned about what was happening to Ursulan and, and what was going on, I feel quite ashamed about how I didn't know before and how shocked I was. Um, I, I came to know about um, Abdullah Ocalan's plight basically through this campaign. I think there was a fringe meeting at TUC and also then I was soon after that at the Miners Gala that you mentioned and I started to learn more and I was horrified. And when I talk to our members about the situation, they are also often unaware beforehand, shocked and horrified. And it's a testament to the power that the work that we can do in educating each other across this movement can have, that there are so many human rights abuses across the world and there are so many stories that need to be highlighted and held up. But rather than use that as a reason to ignore it or to throw up our hands and say we can do nothing, we have to remember that we as a trade union movement, as a labour movement, do have power and we must be a global movement and that we will be stronger the more that we join up globally with each other and recognise that all our struggles are connected. Um, so what we've done is um, in signing up to the campaign, we've strengthened our policy commitments um, to international solidarity and we specifically wish to see the end of Ocalan's imprisonment and also an end to the, the oppression of the Kurdish people. We believe that political and economic democracy extends to everyone and the con conditions that you've been describing that we'll hear more about in this meeting are just abhorrent. 
um, to hear that Nelson Mandela's lawyers are saying actively, this is worse than Mandela endured. And Mandela's experience has really entered into the international you know, memory, I think, of, of something really, truly terrible. I think it, it needs to give us more than pause for thought. So I'm going to finish up by saying, I think it's really important that the work that we do as unions, and I'm speaking on UCU's behalf here, but I think it goes out to the movement more, more broadly, is that we don't see this as, oh, we're okay and everything's fine, but we're going to help those people over there. It's not that. It's that it has to be about truly working together and understanding we're all in struggle and we all have things to learn from each other. And I think that the way that organising is done in in Southeast Turkey, in Rojava, in, and more broadly among the Kurdish diaspora, things like the co-chair system, ways of embedding equality in the struggle, in the work that we do, in the way that we press for a better world, is something that I know my union can do better at, and I know that all of our unions can probably do better at, and there are lots of things for us to learn, and I'm excited about how much there is to learn, and I'm committed to making sure that we as UCU union here in the UK are going to be part of that. Um, I'm interested in hearing what everyone has to say and making links and trying to ensure that we encourage our branches to affiliate to the campaign as well as the affiliation that we have at that UK level. Um, so I guess I will finish on the note of it's up to us to build and organise and we are always, always stronger together. Thank you. Th thanks again, Vicky, for your, your brilliant inter intervention. I think everyone would agree with the sentiments you've expressed and I, I have to say I, I find it really encouraging as well if the events that we had at TUC and Durham have helped introduce you and others to the campaign because it should give us all a bit of strength that if we carry on doing it we can build this campaign further and build the power that we really need to put pressure on the Turkish state to actually bring about change. We know we've got a big job to do to get the wider trade union movement um, involved and much more active. But as long as we've got unions and interventions like yours, I'm confident over time that we can get there. So thanks so much. And we wish you all the best and stand in solidarity with your struggle that you've got going on as well. Colleagues, um, without further ado, I'm going to hand the floor across to um, a really great colleague of ours, Lloyd Russell Moyle. He's the MP for Brighton and Kemptown since 2017, chair of the all-party parliamentary group on Kurds in Turkey and northeastern Syria. Lloyd was actually one of, was the first MP to actually visit the northeastern Syrian region uh, since the outbreak of the um, conflict in Syria. He's been tireless and an inspiration as well in trying to get some of these things moving. So, Lloyd, thanks for taking the trouble to join us and the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Simon, and, and thank you very much to um, all the trade unions uh, that continue to support this cause. A solidarity to UCU and Vicky for your members who are on strike uh, at the moment, but also uh, it is great to see um, you, Simon, uh, from Unite and, and Doug, uh, from uh, who of course was my general secretary when I was very first uh, in, in a union um, of the, of the um, Community News Workers uh, Union. But anyway, um, back to what's important, which is um, of course uh, the topic not only of um, Abdullah Erjulan and his incarceration, but it is for me about the um, the cornerstone of peace in uh, for a people and in a region that is so important for our world. Um, for people uh, because I genuinely believe some of the ideas that Abdullah has put forward um, of democratic confederalism, of environmentalism, of feminism, of from the democracy from the ground up in a region that historically, of course, is the, um, the homeland of 
human civilization in many respects, but also has had such a torrid recent history because of the meddling and interference primarily of, um, of, of colonial powers, of one colonial power over another, drawing lines, uh, and where democracy has been a rare sight. But actually democratic confederalism um, and some of those principles uh, that are put forward provide a route map for not kind of Western interventionist bombing for democracy, which some people seem to think um, is still possible, despite all the failures um, of the past, but actually is something about bringing peoples and communities together from the bottom up, recreating a democratic um, uh, confederalist system. But it only works if you deal with the fact that the leader of this movement, the inspiration of many of these ideas, is still locked up um, in some of the most appalling conditions. Um, his voice is denied. And of course, that is used, support of him is used in Turkey as an excuse to clamp down and marginalize people who are fighting for their right for self-determination, a core basic right. So there's a lot still to do. Some of that is to push our government because what is the role of British citizens? The role of British citizens and a British member of parliament is not to go around condemning other countries around the world, although I can condemn Turkey and their treatment, but actually is to push our government and our allies, you know, kind of those who say we should spend our time just condemning our non-allies, uh, I think miss the point of international politics. It is to hold to account our country and hold to account our allies. Well, in both these accounts, we have to do more. Turkey is supposedly our country's ally, and we need to do more in pushing them to actually see sense and to realise their treatment um, is unacceptable. But we also have to do more in Britain, and particularly in how the British state sees this conflict. It's undeniably a conflict, but it can no longer be seen, in my view, as a conflict that is a basis of terrorism. It's always been shaky on that basis, but needs to be a legitimate internal struggle in which Britain plays a role to help resolve. And Britain has a role, should have a role, because Britain did have a positive role. Um, uh, the, sorry, I shouldn't say the people of Britain, <laughs> the British state arguably had a negative role, but the people of Britain had a positive role in South Africa in, in making sure that the regime there was held to account. And the people of Britain, um, uh, in the end, came to a resolution in Northern Ireland, um, whilst this government and the state seems to be wrecking a lot of that, but they came together to try and find a solution and a way forward. And that is why our role and our voices are so important. So look, I I'm very much uh, um, think that it's important we continue to spread this message. When we held the Westminster Hall debate uh, on, on, on the political treatment of Kurds in Turkey, so many of my colleagues came up and said, we didn't really uh, know about this. We didn't know that this existed and we didn't know the parallels of Mandela. So specifically, you know, kind of on an island, solitary confinement um, and a, a leader that calls for peace and a peaceful resolution. And so part of our task is to keep talking about it, to keep educating people about it and to keep pushing that there is a solution a peaceful, progressive solution, and that starts with the release of him, but it continues through an active dialogue. Now, that might happen. Uh, that might also require us internationally to put more pressure on organisations like the CHP. I hope that the ruling party in, uh, in Ankara does not have long left to last. There are positive signs there, but let's be in no confusion. The alternative, which is a CHP coalition, also historically has problems on this issue, you know, kind of, uh, but they are with the HDP, the Labour Party's sister parties, and we need to do more, both in Britain, but actually at the European Party of Socialists to get the CHP and the HDP working together on a plan that would resolve this issue 
allow a proper coalition going forward and kick out the current ruling party, which has become more uh, um, dangerous as we speak in Turkey. But the solution can only be again through solving the situation of, of Abdullah Öcalan, because it cannot work if the CHP are not on board as well and they commit to those things going forward as well. So this is a keystone, in my view, of a jigsaw puzzle, of an inspiration in the Middle East for how democracy can be bottom up, peaceful solutions in Turkey and a progressive Turkey as well. But if we don't get this sorted, nothing else falls into place. Lloyd, thanks um, ever so much for your intervention and really appreciate the courage that you've shown in dealing with what are difficult issues and that a lot of people run away from all the time. You have absolutely been at the forefront of that and making sure they are addressed and that the um, and brought to a wider audience as well. So thank you so much for all your work and we look forward to carrying on working with you and building this campaign further. Colleagues, I want to just thank um, all the speakers from this first session. Forgive me, I should have mentioned at the start, the way we organised tonight was to hear from um, people from the Imrali delegation and from the UK uh, campaign to free Abdullah Erjelan. I'm going to hand across now to my co-chair, Christine Blower, who is a member of the House of Lords and former General Secretary of the teachers union to look after our second section which is really going to bring in we've got some great speakers christine will introduce them and it will bring into a broader international context why this campaign is so important and how we can try and build it and move forward from there so thank you to everyone in this session christine i will hand over to you now thanks a lot simon thank you very much and we take our lead from our friends and comrades uh, in the Kurdish movement, and we have co-chairs. I'm delighted to be a co-chair uh, with Simon of this organisation. Let me first of all add my thanks uh, to those people who've spoken in the first part. I was <clears throat> privileged to be a part of the delegation, but only for one of the two days, but I have been on the delegations previously. And I, I know that we are enormously well received by our friends and comrades uh, in, in Turkey who, realize that actually it is important that uh, international voices are raised in their support and we amplify uh, their cause. Um, th so there is a critical role for the trade union movement in the in the UK as there is a critical role for the for the Kurds themselves as there is a critical role for all uh, human rights activists and Vicky uh, touched on briefly the uh, the issue of women and the importance of women's liberation and the importance of the equality of women to the thinking of Abdullah Öcalan. You heard Simon at the top of this meeting talking about equality, social justice, women's rights, solidarity and internationalism, all of those values which we share with Öcalan and with our uh, Kurdish friends and comrades. Um, you also heard uh, Lloyd talk about the APPG the all-party parliamentary group. I'm very pleased to be a part of that. And one of the other things that our APPG must also address, I think, is the question of the ultimate delisting of the PKK. The fact that the PKK is listed as a terrorist organisation is not just a problem in Turkey. It's a problem for Kurds globally who support uh, the Kurdish struggle and who want a Kurdish a solution to the Kurdish question. Uh, and of course, uh, as leader of the PKK, it heaps more problems onto the head of Abdel Öcalan. So working on the delisting of the PKK as friends and comrades in Belgium uh, have been doing is really important. And as you heard from uh, Ogmundo, the question of isolation is absolutely critical. Uh, it's just miraculous to me that Öcalan has continued to, to write and to think notwithstanding the awful situation in which he finds himself. So now we're going to hear some uh, Kurdish voices who will uh, add, I think, as Vicky was saying, to our understanding of the situation. Um, and <clears throat> the first person we're going to, we're going to hear from uh, is, uh, is Saleh Muslim, who will speak on how Erçelan has inspired 
uh, their society. And uh, Saleh is a leading Syrian Kurdish politician and foreign representative working on, be on behalf of North and East Syria in Rojava, uh, the autonomous region where millions of people uh, live in a political system organized on the principles of Ocalan's democratic confederalism. Uh, Sally, we're delighted to have you with us. The floor is yours. Well, uh, thank you very much, Christian. Uh, hello to all friends uh, joining these uh, events and uh, thank you for uh, giving me this opportunity to talk to you. Well, first of all, as a Kurdish uh, member or Kurdish society member, a Kurdish man, I would like to say, yes, we have a very, very bad enemies uh, in the world. And uh, beside that, we have a very, very good, the best friends in the world like you, which they are, um, we feel that uh, really we have the human, as a human being, we have a solidarity with us and we have friends like you uh, to be with, with us. I mean, so this is a, a, a good point. Thank you very much for all of you. Yeah, for uh, ourselves, I mean, uh, how, um, and the second point I want to mention, uh, by defending Mr. Ocalan or um, uh, rising his problem and his situation, I think it's not only one person, it's related to, and only not to the Kurdish people, it's related to all the people here in the Middle East, I mean, uh, like uh, what we have here in, uh, I am in Syria, now I'm in Hazaka. Uh, we have Syriacs, we have Kurdish people, we have Arabs. All of them are inspired by the Ojalan's ideas and his project for the, how to live together. I mean, uh, united people in the um, democratic confederalism, living together. And we have a system established here. So uh, defending, uh, Ojalan, it means you are defending all those people and uh, supporting them for their rights and their demands. So uh, this is one point. Uh, for our people, as uh, I, how we were in inspired by Mr. Ojalan, as you know, I mean, in 1979, Mr. Ojalan was in Lebanon. I mean, he just crossed the border because of the military coup in uh, in Turkey. So he went out, he came to Syria and Lebanon and uh, he stayed with the camp, I mean a camp he called al Bukha for um, maybe he was around for 20 years, but he uh, never came to the Kurdish area only when he passed from the north uh, to Rojava to Syria to go to the Palestinians, uh, Palestinian camps in Lebanon, as um, I mean, uh, as a member of the Palestinian revolution. So uh, he went there then uh, in 1980 and 82, uh, you know, there was a, a struggle, I mean, between the Israelis and uh, when they attacked Lebanon. So at that time, uh, our people over there, I mean, the Sir Roger Lanz, uh, people, they resisted against this invasion of uh, Israelis and they became known as uh, a very struggler and very uh, good fight fighters, I mean, among the Palestinians because they didn't leave their place. At that time, uh, our people, I mean, the Kurdish people started to know him and to go. So the Syrians, I mean, the Syrian Kurds were going to there and his ideas, of course, I mean, uh, in the Kurdish history is the first time you can find uh, such a leader, I mean, talking for, uh, I mean, for the Kurdish people, for their independence and for their freedom, uh, for the democracy and uh, with the other nations and so, so all the people, I mean, maybe in that camps, maybe we have uh, thousands of the uh, Kurdish people, young people who uh, joined PKK and they became a guerrillas and they started to fight in the mountains. So all the people, I mean, I remember in 1990, 1991, 1992, we had tens of
just for some celebrations. So, uh, yeah, so, um, I mean, maybe he didn't came to the Kurdish areas, but the Kurdish people, they went there. And all those people, I mean, the, even the Kurdish people and the young people who joined the, the party and the guerrilla movements, they were, I mean, they know what to do and how to fight. And they, even ideologically, they were tied to Mr. Uh, Ojalan. So they were fighting there, I mean, maybe in 19, 1990 and uh, then to till 2000, 2000. So uh, those people, I mean, who joined those guerrillas and those parties as ideologically and politically, uh, they were, I mean, a big amount. When the Syrian revolution started in 2010, many of them, they returned back to defend their villages, to defend their death here in Syria against those mercenaries which were sent by Turkey, just like Islamics. I mean, even before uh, ISIS came in, before ISIS, there were many groups, jihadist groups, and they were invading and they were coming to our areas. So we had to defend ourselves and they, established YPG and YPJ uh, movement defense units and the people defense units the, uh, against those groups. And all of them, all the people they have established, I mean, these uh, uh, defense units, uh, they were in the ideas of Mr. Ojala. And then we had also the political party as a PYD, which is a member of it. Uh, political party, it was against according to the philosophy and the ideas of Mr. Rojava. So we can say in all Rojava, all the Kurdish people and their movements and even defense units, they were inspired by Mr. Rojava's idea. And they organized themselves according to that. And now we have a system here, I mean, in Rojava, we are living together with the Arabs, with the Syriacs, with the Turkmens, I mean, Everybody is free, and uh, of course, I mean, maybe most of you, you know the the women rights. I mean, the just uh, gender equality, and so everything is established here according to Mr. Ojalan's idea and his philosophy. So this became a model for the Middle East. I mean, the, the inspired by Ojalan's ideas, and so it it became a model not only for Syria and not only for the Kurdish people, but also for all the Middle East. And by this organization and uh, organizing the people and or the, organizing the defense units, maybe we were a part of the world when we able to defeat ISIS and attack our areas. And now we are fighting against ISIS, maybe mostly in the Arab, uh, Arab areas. I mean, in Deir Ezzor and the other places. So maybe you have heard about these recent attacks in the Hasaka prison, which I am talking now from Hasaka. Mm. Uh, maybe you know of it. Uh, can you imagine? I mean, they were trying. It, it, the plan, the plans for this attack was done by Turkey. They were planning to have uh, those five thousand uh, prisoners, which all of them are fighters. I mean, very hard fighters of Daesh to be out, and then they will weaponize them and control Hasaka, and then maybe. I mean, can you imagine if you have 5,000 fighters of Daesh, those who were released and they will reach to Turkey and to the other places, and even maybe most of them, they are European, will come to Europe also. So can you imagine what will happen in the, in the world? And as you know, the result was not like that. Of course, we have paid the hundreds of martyrs and just we kept them down in uh, and. Uh, of course, I mean, the friends like you, maybe they, they can even make pressure, as Mr. Simon said also, maybe you can make pressure in the in your government and so, because now, even last week, most of you maybe you have seen uh, the weapons which were captured in the hands of those, uh, I mean, jihadists and so, they were NATO, uh, NATO weapons, NATO weapons were in their hands. I'm going yeah. to ask you if you could come to a conclusion of your remarks, because we still have three other speakers and I, oh, I don't want oh, to lose the 
audience, Mr. Okay, so, so uh, once again, I thank you all, all friends of you, and just believe we are defending not only ourselves, but really we are defending ourselves at the same time, we are defending all the humanity and humanitarian values here in Rojava, in Hasaka. And uh, thank you very much again for listening to me. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Mr. Muslim. We offer you very great solidarity. Thank you for being with us. And uh, and now we move to uh, Merit Chutek, who co-founded the Kurdish Women's Relations Office uh, in South Eastern Kurdistan in, in Northern Iraq in 2014. Um, she's on the editorial board of Genealogy, the journal, the journal and writes in uh, a weekly column in the only Kurdish newspaper in Europe. Meryl, the floor is yours. Thank you for joining us. Uh, thank you. And uh, thank you all for organizing this important online rally on the 23rd uh, anniversary of, um, of this international conspiracy against uh, Abdullah Öcalan and uh, the whole Kurdish uh, liberation movement. Um, yes, so um, there have been many leaders in the countries of the Middle East uh, throughout the last century uh, that have presented themselves like supporters of uh, women's rights and uh, gender equality from Mustafa Kemal, uh, the founder of the Turkish uh, Republic, to Habib uh, Bourguiba in uh, Tunisia and uh, many others. And most of them portrayed themselves as a father figure uh, in relation to the feminist movement, but actually uh, their approach was not really about shaking the social relations order, but more to embrace uh, women's rights in the framework of Western uh, modernization. Abdullah Öcalan's approach to women's liberation is not and never has been like this. What makes him unequaled both in the Middle East and worldwide is his understanding of the gender question or the enslavement and exploitation of women as the first and main social conflict in history. For him, the nucleus of exploitation, of oppression, power and domination is hidden in the woman's question or the gender question. And therefore social change, democratic transformation and liberation is only possible through or in a dialectic relation to women's liberation. This in turn requires an autonomous women's movement within the broader movement with separate structures based on a truly radical and revolutionary women's liberation ideology. And such an autonomous women's movement is needed in order to play a leading role in the democratic reorganization of society. And in this sense, uh, according to Abdullah Öcalan's view and in general in the practice in Kurdistan, women's rights are not only about giving women their rights. Women's rights are essential for change. When Abdullah Öcalan proposed the co-chair system with a man and a woman sharing the same position, he did not only aim to ensure women's equal participation and overcoming women's quotas, because before in the Kurdish movement, we had at least at the end, we had 40% women's quota by implementing equal representation in all bodies was also not only for ensuring 50-50 participation. What is essential here in the, in the thinking of Ajalan is the functionality of women's equal participation and representation, which is manifesting itself today in the co-chair system. Female co-chairs, politicians and activists, which are organized in the autonomous women's movement have the task to fill their position with a freedom mindset and by doing so pioneering democratic change. Co-chair system is not about sharing power, but uh, overcoming it through a new democratic political culture. You do not have such an approach anywhere else in the Middle East, and it's not limited to the Kurdish movement today, but spreading also to uh, Turkish and Arab organizations uh, as well. In this sense, the Kurdish women's movement does not only struggle for gaining rights as women, 
but to pioneer the struggle for democratic and free society and political system in Kurdistan and the Middle East through her achievements. Moreover, women's rights are not only written down in, for example, the social contract of Rojava or internal bylaws. Uh, these achievements of the organized women's movement, which are reflected in written women's rights, are instrumental also in changing the mindset of the society and challenging patriarchy and sexism. In this sense, the written rights live and change. And we have very revolutionary rights and laws in Kurdistan, like, for example, the criminalization of polygamy and political bodies, or the rule to exclude men who are violent. Before the Turkish state appointed trustees in Kurdish government municipalities, internal bylaws said that the salary, for example, the salary of, of staff members that are violent should be paid to their wives. In this process of rebuilding a democratic and free society in Rojava and Northeast Syria and in other places is also inspired by Öcalan's ideas about freedom. Here, women did not only lead the armed resistance against ISIS and Turkish occupation, but gave the whole revolutionary struggle a female character. And therefore, we talk about a women's revolution in Rojava. But that does not mean that the revolution is only for women or about women's rights. No, but women's role has become a norm here. The organized women's movement is a guarantee for democracy, for freedom and justice. And this role of her has been recognized by the majority of society, not just the Kurdish society, but also the other ethnics uh, that are uh, sharing uh, the, la la the land with the Kurdish people. And often we also see that people insist on the presence of women in, uh, for example, conflict situations, as there is a very big trust in the women's movement today. The Middle East is and has been seen to so numerous conflicts and permanent chaos and wars for nearly 200 years. This region of the world is the place where thousands of years ago, matrilineal societies with a strong goddess belief occurred for the first time in human history, but the Middle East has also been the cradle of patriarchy. In this sense, starting in the 70s, it has never been easy for Abdullah Öcalan and his movement to convince people about the decisive role of women's rights in an atmosphere of war, of, of, of chaos, uh, where people tend to think that there are more important issues than women's rights, or for example, the autonomous organization of women. But um, profound analysis, um, resistance, and um, yeah, separate organization of the women's movement and also very big sacrifices opened uh, and transformed, opened the way and transformed uh, the Kurdish revolution into a women's revolution. And the Kurdish women do not only struggle for themselves and in their own country, they want to share the achievements with the women around, to, uh, women of the world and especially of the Middle East and struggle together for freedom, democracy, peace and justice. They have already organized numer uh, numer a lot of conferences and meetings and also established alliances in the Middle East uh, through which they try to organize the common struggle. And these uh, alliances of women in the Middle East aim, aim to improve the situation of women by creating a democratic change. And for such a change, it is crucial to challenge the main ideological expressions of the capitalist nation state, which are nationalism or chauvinism, religionism and sectarianism, sexism and misogyny, because through these lacks of capitalist modernity, war, crisis and chaos is reproduced on a daily basis in the whole Middle East. In this sense, to come to an end, Abdullah Öcalan's ideas his model of a democratic nation as solution to the main problems of the Middle East and his physical freedom are crucial for both democracy, peace and freedom in Kurdistan and the whole region, as well as for guarantee of women's rights into the future. That's the reason why women's organizations in the Middle East are currently preparing for the announcement of a new 
regional women's initiative for the freedom of optological and which will happen soon, I hope. Thank you very much. Meryl, thank you very much for a, a very clear and extremely interesting exposition on the position of women and the importance of women's rights to that, to the ideological position. So now we move on to uh, a contribution from Fazela Mohammed, who comes to us direct from South Africa, uh, Human Rights uh, Action Group, which promotes the idea of human rights for the Kurdish people in Turkey and in other countries, and they promote a just peace in Turkey uh, <clears throat> and campaign with the Freedom for Öcalan campaign and the within the Congress of uh, South African Trade Unions, Kosatu. Uh, the floor is yours, Hosella. Hello, everyone. Good evening. Uh, thank you for inviting me, to the organizers, for inviting me to speak at today's session. Um, you know, I've been asked to speak about the parallels between Mandela, you know, the release Mandela campaign and the Abdullah Ocalan campaign. I think that for us in South Africa, the, you know, the release of Ocalan campaign has great resonance. For many of us who were activists in the struggle in the 1980s, we remember vividly the struggle for the release of Mandela and all other political prisoners. So when people talk about the kind of the parallels between, uh, you know, the release Mandela campaign and the Abdullah Ocalan campaign, you know, Mandela's arrest was very much instrument. I, I mean, it was uh, to a large extent, he was caught because of the information given to the then apartheid regime by the CIA. You know, you can see the role of international forces there where they actually created the conditions for Mandela's arrest. Then, I mean, after his incarceration, he went to Robben Island, placed on an island, and even though he didn't suffer the same level of isolation and deprivation, they were too were removed from society. They too were placed on a far-flung island where nobody could reach. And it was meant to represent, uh, you know, their isolation from South Africa and their removal, their physical removal from the struggle of the people of South Africa. But uh, for us, in South Africa, when we pursued our struggle, we said that the international solidarity was a fundamental aspect of our struggle for freedom. And I think that, you know, whenever you say we do the, this work for the release of political prisoners or political prisoners in oppressive regimes, we often, um, we often think that, um, you know, Sometimes as ordinary people, we think, can it be effective? But I want to quote Mandela, on what he said about the solidarity that he received from people of the world. He said, every day we heard your voices ring. Free political prisoners, we heard your voices sing. Let my people go. We heard the vibrant and invigorating cry of human concern. We knew that we would be free. And I think that's an important thing because international solidarity is just not about uh, calling for it, writing papers, putting, uh, you know, requests out. It's real for the people who suffer oppression. I mean, we knew that in 1988, I think it was, on the 17th of July, 250,000 people marched in London for the release of Nelson Mandela. I think this was powerful at a time when Thatcher called Mandela a terrorist. So the, the words and the voices of ordinary people can make a huge impact in a society. So whatever the government said at the time about people like Mandela, people like Ocalan, when the people's voices ring, you cannot turn that tide. And I think, uh, you know, the anti-apartheid movement first um, called for the release of political prisoners in South Africa in 1963, in October 1963. So it was 25 years before we saw the massive build up to the campaign. So like Mandela said, you know, the road of the struggle, the road, there's a long walk to freedom. And so I think we must all brace ourselves that there is a long way ahead, but we actually need to do the work. And I think that 
you know, I think that uh, I was great friends with Mr. Amit Kathrada. I mean, I worked for him when he got released from prison. And when I moved to Cape Town to work in the first democratic parliament, he lived in the same building as us. And we developed a great friendship with him, somebody like Lalu Chiba. So Mr. Mr. Kathrada served 27 years with Nelson Mandela. Lalu Chiba served 18 years. And I spent many hours with them. And for me, what was most remarkable, and I, I can see it in the writings of Ochelan, the lack of bitterness and the ability to look forward to a democratic society, the ability to move beyond personal re retribution and the immense solidarity um, between those prisoners. You know, everybody knew that we said, release Mandela campaign, but that campaign was not only about the release of Mandela, it encapsulated many other things. It encapsulated the re release of all political prisoners in South Africa. It encapsulated all the political ideals of the South African society. Uh, I think one of the other um, speakers spoke about, <clears throat> I'm just uh, looking at the notes, you know, um, Repressive regimes must have persecution. They must persecute those who stand up to them. They must try to isolate those people from society. They, they must uh, stop any, any voices. So any legitimate space to speak up against the oppression must be closed. And I think we see that in Turkey all the time, the erosion of um, freedoms, the, the continued persecution, the absurdly long political sentences, those are all the fundamentals of a repressive regime. And if you do human rights work anywhere, you will see that it is identical. And I think that for us who work as human rights activists, we know that these things are things that must be systematically addressed. I think in South Africa, I feel very sad that sometimes our own government uh, also kind of legitimizes people like Erdogan. I mean, for me, it was a sense of huge disappointment when the ANC, the liberation movement of our country, invited him to the birthday celebrations. And I, I think there was a blot on the history of South Africa. And I think that more and more, all of us, wherever we sit in the corners of the world, ordinary people, I'm not a big time, you know, I'm not a well-known person. I'm just an ordinary rank and file activist. But I think all of us need to speak up against that. And we need to make sure because Mandela was free, the ANC was unbanned through the struggles of our own people on the ground. Every single day, we paid heavily with blood, but also because many like-minded, democratically minded, progressive people of the world stood up against the apartheid regime. They, they made sure that the atrocities was highlighted. So I think for us in South Africa, we just need to say more needs to be done. There was a lot done in the Mandela campaign where others can learn from, but we live in a new era now, social media, different ways of organizing. But I think that all of us, if we lend our hand, we can actually grow this campaign immensely. And of course, uh, the final thing that I want to talk about is that people who fight for freedom are looking for justice and peace wherever they are. And like Mandela, Ochelan is looking for, for a society away from the evil that they face right now. And I think that there's no freedom to be won only by war. There must be negotiations. But like we said in South Africa, negotiations can only be conditional upon the release of all political prisoners, on the <clears throat> repeal of all those discriminatory, discriminatory laws and a genuine commitment by the regime to actually engage in change. Uh, so I think for us from South Africa, that's, that's how we see the struggle. Obviously, people have different experiences and the Kurdish people have got an immense struggle ahead, ahead of them. But you know, in 1989, if you asked any South African, we were in the midst of a state of emergency. We thought apartheid would endure. And then I know one of my close comrades died in December, 1989 you know, was killed uh, in, in the struggle. And in February, 1990, we had the unbanning of the ANC and the Communist Party in South Africa. So not to despair, but peace will find a way and all of us must do our work to speak up. Thank you.
Fadela, thank you so much. I want to say to you that my own three-year-old daughter was on that July demonstration in London and it made a difference, frankly, to her whole life. She's significantly over 30 now and she really understands the importance of international solidarity and struggling for the idea that no one is free until we are all free and that's really where we must be. And the, the absence of bitterness that you mentioned, I think, is a, is a really critical point, too. Thank you very much for joining us, Fazela. Uh, and our last speaker of the evening is Elif Sarakan. I'm sure very well known to all of you. She is the co-chair of the UK Kurdish Assembly, which is the main representative organisation of Kurds in the UK, representing and lobbying for hundreds and thousands of UK Kurds. Elif also sits on the UK trade union Freedom for Ochelan campaign. She's a great friend and comrade. Elif, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Christine. Um, I mean, I feel like there's been such a wealth of contributions, you know, from actually every perspective and angle that can be probably important to this conversation, especially on the 23rd anniversary of the abduction of Abdullah Ochelan. I mean, I think Vicky touched on it too, and everyone else just it's just not only stopping and understanding the magnitude of what that abduction was and what and what we need to do to continue but also how we how we do the work to actually change some change things in action but before i begin i want to uh, send my solidarity on behalf of the uk kurdish assembly to everyone um all ucu members striking at the moment um, we are with, of course, all workers and uh, labourers who are struggling um, for better conditions, so solidarity. And also I see it's kind of nice, especially because of the couple of years that we've had all the familiar names that I can see in the audience as well. And I hope this isn't too embarrassing for him, but I really want to recognise um, uh, who uh, Chris Skirfield, who we have with us today, who's the father of Costa Skirfield, the first British volunteer who fell in the fight against ISIS is, you know, the solidarity that Chris and Vasiliki have um, shown the Kurdish people following their son's incredible sacrifice has been invaluable. So thank you very much. And it's great to see you here, Chris. And of course, many other friends as well, but I particularly wanted to point out Chris being here. Um, I mean, I think a lot has been uh, mentioned about the conditions of Ojalan, the ideas of Ojalan and uh, what we can do from a trade union perspective, but also from a general internationalist solidarity perspective. Now, when we talk about the conditions of uh, Mr. Abdullah Ojalan, the conditions he has held in for 23 years, I think certain certain bits of detail are also important to understand that magnitude the fact that until about 10 years ago or so he was the sole prisoner on this island on a on, a, on an island that only has this prison that is guarded by about 1000 soldiers and in conditions that are basically amount to torture as also confirmed by the committee for the prevention of torture of course we call on them to actually take action on these um, rulings and on these reports as well. Um, and also, you know, some friends and comrades have spoken about, um, you know, the general conditions of uh, prisons in Turkey. Doug spoke about, you know, some of these um, new measures of after some people <coughs> have been in prison for 30 years, what some of the kind of excuses that are found to keep them in and one of the reasons why supposedly Ojalan has not been permitted to speak to his lawyers or his family in the last in the last couple of years is apparently quote-unquote due, due to disciplinary measures obviously there's always some sort of an excuse but it's it's this special warfare that is, that is carried out by the Turkish state that extends to everyone and I think um I think it's important to understand now, you know, like I said, everyone has gone into um, detail about the various perspectives that are crucial, but I wanted to um, talk a little bit about the conditions of Abdullah Ojalan, the incarceration as a whole of Abdullah Ojalan, and obviously to begin with his abduction, the listing and the prescription of the PKK as a terrorist organization is 
entirely a war against self-determination. The self-determination of the Kurdish people, but self-determination as a whole. Now we could go into the so-called war on terror, the 20 year history of it. There's been a lot of discussion about it in the last couple of years as the anniversary, well, not anniversary, but as the kind of second decade of it in its official sense um, has uh, come to an end. But I think it's important to understand how this has affected the Kurdish people. And it's essentially to say that these people, the Kurdish people who have dared to fight for their own self-determination, who have dared to try and determine their own fate, who have dared to uh, establish or build an alternative system will be punished and will be disciplined essentially you know the listing of the PKK the uh, incarceration of Abdullah Öcalan is essentially a disciplining measure for an entire nation so I think it's really important to understand how that affects especially the Kurdish community all around the world this is not just um, the effects in Kurdistan obviously but the criminalization of the Kurdish community all around uh, Europe and the world and how you know again Lloyd was talking about some of the work that they've done as the APPG and one of the reports they did on Kurdish representation in Turkey also found that the listing of the PKK is, is applied as a blanket um, policy essentially on all Kurdish activities, you know, cultural activities, um, activities obviously around language, um, acti activities around women's equality, women's liberation, um, ecology, you know, uh, the the co-chair system or being a co-chair especially for a woman can be an indictment for terrorism in Turkey this is the this is the situation of it and it's I think it's important to understand just what the Kurdish people and the coalitions that have been built the common struggles that have been built are fighting against in the Middle East but also um, in other parts of the world now I think it's important um, as we conclude to talk about how we can continue to work together. Of course, we have the Freedom for Ajahn trade union campaign, as Simon mentioned, there's 17 trade unions in support. Um, I think the most crucial work we have to do, um, as some friends have already mentioned today, is really bring this down more and more, this campaign to the branches, to the rank and file, and to the grassroots of the trade union movement, to be able to build the international solidarity that is so that is so foundational to the fabric of the uh, trade union movement in Britain, but of course um, in other parts of the uh, in other parts of the world as well. And I think also um, to crucially in particularly in Britain to hold the British government to account and to push the British government to stop its particularly its arms trade with Turkey, because Turkey is not just an issue. Uh, for the Kurdish people. Turkey is an issue, or Turkey's arms trade or arms deals are an issue for, um, you know, I saw recent reports of uh, Turkish um, drones and Turkish weapons being used against the people of Tigray uh, um, by Ethiopia, in Sudan, and in Morocco, and in Qatar. You know, the arms trade that is, that is, um, that is emboldened by between Britain and Turkey allows Turkey to then also sell arms to other parts of the world to again further oppress people as well. So this is no longer and hasn't been for a while a matter of just the Kurdish people, but this is a matter of the issue that the Turkish state is in the Middle East and actually for many other parts of the world as well. So I think that's really important to push on is the is the arms trail arms trade. It's to push on the delisting of the PKK as the um, as the uh, APPG has, has all already started to do, asking the British government to review its listing of the PKK. It's to ask for the freedom and demand the freedom of Abdullah Öcalan. It's not only that the time has come, obviously the time is overdue. And again, I think we've seen today by all the contributions that the freedom of Abdullah Öcalan is what connects all, all, the, all these issues that we've discussed. And therefore the freedom of Abdullah Öcalan, his ability to negotiate a peaceful solution to the conflict between the Kurdish people and the Turkish state 
is is needed and Abdullah Ojan's freedom is needed for that. And at this point, the freedom is crucial for those negotiations because we have also seen examples of the negotiations being carried out in bad faith between 2013 and 2015. And uh, the Turkish state or the Turkish side, you know, quote unquote, being able to stop these at, at, on a whim because they feel like, or it's not, it's not politically beneficial no longer. So there needs to be a more equal negotiation ground. And for that to happen, the freedom of Abdullah Ajan is necessary and all the other steps will uh, come with it. So I think I'll end there. And um, thank you very much for joining. And thank you, Simon and Claire and Christine uh, for all your work in organizing this uh, rally, but also in the Freedom for Ajan campaign. Christine, you're Sorry, muted. Sorry, unmute, yeah. Sorry. Oh, dear, oh, dear. I hope to know by now, shouldn't I? Thank you very much, Elif, I repeat, for um, for your contribution, but also for all the work uh, that you do. Uh, and, and for always sounding so clear and determined and telling us what we've got to do and we need to get on with it. Before I hand back to Simon, I just want to say um, I, I'd like to record um, solidarity to UCU friends and comrades on behalf of my own union, the NEU, which is the largest education union in Europe. And we have extremely good solidaris solidaristic uh, relationship with Ejim Sen, the education union in Turkey. Um, and we know that they suffer a huge amount of repression too, as they have um, very many Kurdish members. They are es essentially a kind of Kurdish union, really. Um, so the NEU, uh, as Simon said, there continues to be um, in support of this campaign and we will do, I'm sure, everything that we possibly can. I thank once again the speakers in this half of the meeting. The pandemic, of course, has been awful, but, you know, now that we've learned to use Zoom, although I did forget to unmute then, but now that we've learned to use Zoom, you know, we do have the advantage of being able to hear directly voices from South Africa, from Syria and so on, which, you know, we would not have imagined that we could have done quite so easily uh, before the pandemic. But I hand back to you, Simon, to uh, send us away with a spring in our step and a you know, renewed uh, determination to fight this campaign for freedom for Ajlan. Simon. Thanks a lot, Christine. And again, thank you for always, you know, having been active in the campaign right from the start and continuing to do everything you can for it. I, I want to just reiterate your, your thanks to all the speakers, you know, to Ogmunda and Doug for talking about the Imrali delegation, which has just happened virtually. It's always normally in person, but the pandemic prevents that I think it'll be great if next year we can well I hope we don't have to have a meeting like this next year and uh, Abdullah Erjalan would be free but um, with things as they are sadly I think we may end up having to do it and I think it's always more effective when it's in person again I do want to just thank again Vicky not just for taking the trouble to be with us um, when she's got so much else going on but I thought the message about how the campaign has managed to reach a wider audience was really inspiring. And all of us should take hope and encourage for, encouragement from that, that we can carry on growing and building. Mer Meryl, from joining us from Sulemania, and again, to underline your comments, Christine, it's about the only good thing about the pandemic is it has made the world smaller, but to be able to hear from Meryl about the um, women's aspect of the revolution and um Urgeland's ideas and how important it is in such a difficult region is really really um inspiring for, for Sally to be able to join us on the ground from Hasaka from the very place where the prison breakout happened and again where Turkey has got its filthy hands behind that prison breakout with all sorts of other motives is should be clear to the world turkey would rather have isis in power in syria than the type of democratic um, structures that sally and our friends are trying to build there and i would um obviously thank elif um, for all the work she always does and like you say bringing it together in such a coherent way 
I want to just finish by um, underlining and really acknowledging and thanking Fazela for her comments, because this has been already a long haul, but some of the things you said, Fazela, about when your first demands were made to get political prisoners released as early as the 60s, and it never came to fruition, sadly, until the very end of the 1980s. But that should give us courage and um, determination to continue. I think the other thing I'd pick out that you said about that march of 250,000 people in London and what uh, turning point that marked, that's where we want to get to. That's where we need to get to. This one thing about the British trade union movement and the wider international movement that I'd really like to underline to close. Many people said we wouldn't get Mandela out of jail and our apartheid would never be toppled, but it was. Our campaigns to get the Miami Five released that were in American jails for such a long time was successful and they are out and free now. And we've got so many examples of Colombian pr political prisoners that we've managed to get out of jail through international pressure. So I'm convinced that um, we can bring Abdella Erdogan to freedom. We can help build the solidarity with the Kurdish people. They have given so much for the wider region and for humanity in their struggles against the evils of ISIS and everything else. I'd like to close by thanking you all for everybody that participated, including my friend Carrie Ann, who's done so much at the international level and in Brussels as well to build solidarity. Let's redouble our efforts. Let's go forward and let's make sure that we get Abdullah Erdogan free and bring about change in the region. Thanks very much to everybody and see you all again soon. Bye.